Well, we're going to pick up today where we left off last week in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, We're going to be in verses 19 through 30 this morning, 19 through 30. Where we left off last week was perhaps one of the greatest statements of faith in all the Bible, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to choose death, Or perhaps God would deliver them, but whatever happened, they were not going to bow the knee to this golden idol, and they were not going to serve the gods of Babylon, no matter what. And so we left last week with them entrusting themselves fully to God, and now we're going to read the exciting conclusion to this story. So please stand to honor the Lord as we read from Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 through 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Verse 21. Then these men were bound in their cloaks and their tunics and their hats, their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. And he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. May the Lord rest, bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... They say that we will not serve or worship the golden image that you have set up. And this sends Nebuchadnezzar into a rage. Anybody with complete power that will not be listened to, it says his facial expression changes. So you can, you can have fun imagining what that is. And in verse 22, it says this matter was urgent. So when you have an angry tyrant who is urgent about things, that usually equals yelling at people and screaming at people and wanting stuff done immediately. And so everybody's running around throwing more wood on the fire because he doesn't want them just dead. He wants them really dead. He wants them burned up before they hit the bottom of this thing. And so they get it so hot and he wants them bound up so they can't move anywhere. And they, they tie him up with all their clothes on, which is interesting. I guess they want him to burn faster. I don't know what. Maybe he's just out of control. Just tie him up with everything they've got on. And we're going to throw him in like this. And so we're not quite clear how this furnace is set up. It, it's, it's, they're throwing them into this thing, but there's a door to it where they can see. And you know, however it's set up, we're not quite sure. But what I can tell you is that this thing was set up not for baking bricks, but for burning people and for killing people. It was apparently very near to where he was set up, and it was on this plane, and it was the purpose of this thing was to motivate people from all these conquered nations to bow down before him. And so they have this opening, and they throw them into this opening, and those that throw them in, even though they're mentioned to be strong and mighty, it kills them from the heat as they throw them in. But what I want us to see in all of this back and forth from verse 19 to 22 is that there is no sign whatsoever that any of these three friends struggle. None of them beg for their lives. 
None of them fight to try to run away. They go patiently and quietly to what is before them. And in considering the scriptures, I think it's always important to think about yourself in a situation like this and how remarkable it is. You've got to take it out of the, the myth category and bring it into the real category. What would I be like if I were facing my death in a situation like this? And it's asked a question of myself, how can these men be like this? How can they possibly have this level of calmness and this level of resolve? As I would tell you this morning, that for a far less serious situation, millions and millions of Americans are eat up by anxiety and fear every single day, to where they sometimes are not able to function for things so much less than this, and yet these men are facing something that none of us will ever face, likely, in our lives, and yet they are at peace. And so what is happening here? How is this possible? I would give to you two basic things that I think are going on in this passage that are very applicable to the lives of every Christian that struggle with anxiety and fear over what is an unknown future before them. The first is this, a sincere belief that God is their protector. A sincere belief that God is our protector. These three friends believed that God was their protector. And this is not a new thing. This is writ everywhere in the Bible. And so I'm going to read a couple of passages to you from the Psalms about this. I don't know uh, how much time you spend in the Psalms. The Psalms are something that people often pass over because there's not a lot of stories there. But what the Psalms are is they are expressions of the heart. They are prayers. They are longings of the heart. But they are scripture. And so part of this is that they express fears, troubles, anxieties, but they always come back to expressions of faith and trust in the Lord God. And it will help you to be able to put the struggles of your heart into words that you were not able to put them into before. And so one of these about God as our protector is Psalm 121. Psalm 121 is the whole psalm is about this. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This psalm has been a tremendous encouragement because it, it speaks to the heart of the godly person. I lift up my eyes to the hills. The idea of being a, an incredible danger, where does a Christian look? They look up. They look up to heaven. Literally, they look up. God, help me. Like, I don't know what's going to happen here. And where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. A person that can earnestly say that, my help comes from the Lord, and they trust in that, it will bring peace to your heart. It's when you look to everything else that anxiety comes rushing in and destroys you. But when you can say, my help comes from the Lord, you will have a difference in heart. Let's read also from Psalm 61, 1 through 5. Psalm 61, 1 through 5. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings, for you, O oh God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Again, the Lord protecting. When we go to the Lord God and seek him and have confidence that he is in fact the protector of our life, peace will come upon you. A peace, as the New Testament says, that passes all understanding. A peace that we cannot really quantify or necessarily explain to another person. But there is a sense that God is near to us and that he is watching over and guiding our lives. And this is the type of peace that these three friends have as they go to what they think is their death. Secondly, a sincere looking towards the hope of eternal life in God our Savior. The other way in which they have this peace, which is so profound, is that they are looking toward the hope of eternal life in God our Savior. 
And so I'll read to you about this from Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. What this is, is a heart that is prepared to leave behind this world. A heart that does not long for the things of this world, does not love this world, but is in fact looking to leave behind this world, to enter into eternal life, to enter into the place that is prepared for them in the kingdom of God, to see Christ Jesus and to be with him to leave behind the struggles of this world and go elsewhere. And so let's read from Colossians chapter three, verses one through four. Then if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is so different than the normal person walking through life, where they are just consumed with the things of this world. Their mind just cycles constantly around the issues and things of this world, and anxieties and troubles and fears and woes just eat them alive. But the person that walks comfortably in Christ, knowing that the Lord God directs and protects their life as a person that is prepared to leave behind this world, a person that seeks to build treasure in heaven, a person that longs to be where Christ is and to leave behind sin and death, a person that yearns for the completion of their salvation. They can see something that has started, but they want to see it finished. A person that seeks, as it says in Hebrews 11, the heavenly city whose designer and builder is God. And so these things, if you are one of these people that struggles greatly with anxiety, which is a universal thing, that's why Jesus speaks about it in the Sermon on the Mount and tells people along these lines to seek after him, I encourage you to not only dwell on some of the verses that I've just read, but to memorize them. Hide them in your heart, and when these anxieties and troubles and fears come upon you in waves, you go back to God's word. You don't go back to another pill or to a a magic counselor that can tell you some special thing. The word of the Lord is what will speak to and calm our heart in a way that nothing else can. And so go to God's word and speak these things back to yourself and remind yourself of the truth of God's word. And that there have been people prior to you that believed these things and God honored these promises and led them through these difficult, difficult times. Well, in verses 24 and 25, Nebuchadnezzar is astonished at what he sees when they are thrown in. There are no screams of death. Instead, he jumps up. And he says, there's, there's four people walking around in there. Did, it, did I miss something? Did we not throw three people in there? No, we did throw three people in there. I guarantee it. You, you know, there's somebody running around like, oh my gosh, did we throw four people in there? If, you're, if you've ever been under somebody who's an angry manager and something goes wrong, you start checking yourself immediately. Maybe we threw four people in. No, we only threw three people in. And the fourth one is like the son of the gods is his description. This is a, as we're going to see, an unbeliever describing what he sees. So you've got a raging, burning fire, and something inside of this thing is more radiant than this burning fire. And it's something that is otherworldly, something that is supernatural. And he describes it like the son of the gods. And so what do we have going on here? What is or who is this person? Well, we're not told exactly, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speculate a little bit for you here. In Daniel chapter 6, which we'll get to in some weeks, we have Daniel as an older man in the lion's den. And it's very clear there that the Lord sends an angel to protect him from these animals, from these wild beasts, which is not uncommon. In the scriptures, we see angels sent from God, and their radiance and their heavenly glory is scary to donkeys or to animals or to, or to us, for that matter. And people step back from it, and it's scary. But I don't believe that that's what we have here. I, my understanding of what we have in this passage is that we have an appearance of the Lord Jesus himself before his incarnation. Throughout the Old Testament, we have this idea of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, which is different from normal angels. There's something divine. When the angel of the Lord appears, there is worship given to the angel of the Lord, and worship is received. When an angel, a messenger from God, is ever worshiped in the Bible, they say, get up. I am not, we don't, you don't worship me, you worship God. 
And so the first thing that I see in this situation that is different than an angelic messenger is that this presence of this angel or angel of the Lord is causing something that is reversing the, the natural order of things. You should be burned up when you get thrown in a raging fire. When you're caught in the midst of a, of a raging storm at sea, it should destroy you. But when Jesus stands in the bow of the boat and he says, peace, be still, and he exerts his authority over nature, the, the, the storm is calmed. When God exerts his power over the natural order of things and people thrown into a burning furnace are not burned up, there's something supernatural happening here. And secondly, I would say that what we have happening in the overall situation is a contest of worship. Somebody's going to be worshipped here. Either Nebuchadnezzar is going to be worshipped and him and his big golden idol, or Almighty God, the God of these conquered Jews, is going to be worshipped. And what we see here is worship does come out of this. And the worship is received by uh, the angel of the Lord. Or there is no telling of people, don't worship me. They, they worship the Lord God. The God of the Jews is a living God. Nobody can deliver like this God can deliver. But thirdly, I think there is a scriptural reason for this. And if you turn with me, or I'll read it for you, but in Isaiah 43... There is a wonderful and fascinating passage that it's very possible that these three friends knew this passage in their devout godliness. From time ago, that was a promise of the Lord being with his people. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. Now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. He says, I will be with you. And when I am with you, the flames will not consume you. Now, I understand that there are many ways this can be applied, but it can also be very real. And for these people, it was exactly what was promised came to pass. And I believe it was the Lord God who was with them, who walked with them in this fire and by faith delivered them. It is important, and where we're going to keep going with this, is that these three friends are walking by faith. They are believing in what is unseen. And it's very, very important for us as we look back to these Old Testament stories to not see these people as fundamentally different than you and I. They didn't have any more clear vision of God than you and I have. They had enough. They had, were given what they needed for that moment in time and in that day. And it was enough for them to believe God and to walk after him. But their faith is used of the Lord to record something that will be encouraging to all generations beyond that. These instances in Daniel are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter that recounts these Old Testament acts of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 33 and 34, it talks about, by faith, the mouths of lions being stopped and the power of fire being quenched. And so what happens in this moment in time is remembered and recorded in the New Testament for us to look back and say, look at these people that believed God. And their salvation was by faith, and their salvation was by faith alone, which is exactly the same as our salvation today. Our salvation is by grace through faith and by faith alone. These friends were more concerned with the fires of hell than the fire of Nebuchadnezzar. By not denying the Lord, they are by faith delivered from both of these flames and taken out of the, the, the fire, as it were, literally, but then also their souls and the strength of their faith is strengthened and not denied. And so I want to make a, a note here because this is you can, it's somewhat of a, of a sidetrack, but I think it's very, very important. I think it's imperative that we realize how God is glorified in this situation. A part of what we draw from Scripture is what is expressly told to us, and a part of what we draw from Scripture is what we do not see there, what does not happen there. And so what does not happen with these friends as they go to this great trial is there is no bargaining, there is no uh, human talent by which they are delivered, 
and there is no force of rebellion or violence where they try to overthrow this evil and extricate themselves from this situation. They are delivered by faith alone. The Lord God is the one who delivers them from this situation. And when I think of and look at and watch the the quietness and the steadiness and the godliness of the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I am reminded of the, the commendation of Paul to us as Christians in the New Testament. He writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, latter part of verse 10 and through 12, we urge you brothers to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. It's a really interesting passage. It's, a, it's, not, what we, it's not a militant passage. It's a passage of quietness, of people working and living in a quiet, faith-filled way. And I believe that this is exactly the attitude of Daniel and his friends, a quiet life, a life that is minding their own affairs in a certain way. They are walking and working and hard work and integrity, and they are prepared for the difficult situations as they come. But this is also the consistent example, I believe, of Jesus and the apostles, which is why it is commanded to us and instructed to us by Paul through this letter to the Thessalonians. That we might walk in the example of all these biblical characters where we are passionate about the gospel and about God's kingdom, but we are peaceable and we are quiet when it comes to the issues of world kingdom building and politics. Because the two struggle against each other And we could talk about this at length, but it is not unreasonable to think that these four men who appear to be the highest ranking Jews that came out of this exile, if there was ever any group of people that could go backwards to the other exiles and say, let's, 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 form a, let's, let's work together and let's overthrow this place or get out of here or do something like that, which is always an option. And people always tend to go towards that route in one way or another, but they don't do that. They live in faithfulness to the Lord with a quiet, peaceable, unbending godliness. I am alarmed uh, in our own country by what appears to me to be growing factions of people who call themselves Christians that believe the moral declines of our day can somehow be solved by violence or by reversing the cultural norms by force. And I can tell you that this will not be the case. It will never, ever win the day. This is not the example of faith that we have here. It's not the command that we have by Paul. And it's not the example that we have of Christian, godly Christians throughout the ages. Every time in church history that Christians wrongly resort to force or violence and thinking that they can advance the kingdom of God in that way, it never, ever, ever works out the way that they hope that it will. The worst example of this in church history is the Crusades, where people literally took up arms and conquered lands and forced conversions, if you will, uh, at the point of the sword. It was a disaster. It's something that we've been apologizing and trying to explain away ever since. A lesser version of this was during a period of the Reformation where the theological part of it had taken off and people became very frustrated then with the Roman Catholic Church and what they saw there and something called the Iconoclast Movement came up where people wanted to just destroy everything that they saw in these churches and they literally went in and physically tore down the idols and broke the windows and mistreated the priests and it became something that was out of control and those that started with the theological change, said, this is, this is not helping. What are you doing? Stop what you're doing because it's, it's hindering what we're trying to do for the kingdom of God, not helping it. And so we must follow the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our offense to the world must be our unending and yet peaceable godliness. Our complete insistence that there is no other God but the Lord Jesus Christ and that we love him, that we obey him, and that we follow his moral imperatives for our lives without wavering. And in this way, we will follow after the example of Christ Jesus, that we live in the world, but we are not of the world. So we are not the same way. We don't respond to the struggles of the world the same way that the world responds to these struggles. 
We see ourselves as strangers and pilgrims passing through this world. Another example, another analogy that is given to us often in the scriptures. That we are passing through, our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven. And in this way, we will influence the world around us for the sake of the kingdom of God. This is why we pray for revival. We pray for the soul to be changed. And as the soul of the nation is changed, so the nation will change. Well, Nebuchadnezzar sees this radiant character and he says, come out. He calls them out of the furnace and they literally walk out of the furnace. And the accusers are there that were so hoping to see them burn to the ground and be done with them and rejoice over seeing those who had displaced them be removed. Instead, they walk out, hair not singed, clothes not harmed, and they don't even smell like smoke. They're completely unhindered, and it alters the entire situation. So what was before Nebuchadnezzar in charge and authority and threatening people to bow down before him, the Lord God of the Jews has unseated the entire situation in a way that no one could ever have expected. And no one cares about the band anymore, and no one cares about the golden statue anymore, and no one is accusing or cursing these men anymore. Instead, they are dumbfounded, and the glory goes to the God of the Jews, who delivered in an unexpected way. It reminds me of Elijah on Mount Carmel with the, with the, with the contest of worship between Elijah and Baal. And who's going to be, the God of the Jews or, or Baal? Who's going to win this contest? And it goes back and forth and back and forth until there's this spectacular end where the Lord God comes in and radically shows himself to be the true and the living God. And so in verses 28 and 29, Nebuchadnezzar begins to, to speak words of praise to God and praising the faithfulness of these men for, for their faith and believing in God. And then he puts out this rash law about how anybody that speaks against them is going to be torn apart and it just sounds like pure Nebuchadnezzar. But what should we make of this? You know, when I was younger, I'm like, man, Nebuchadnezzar you know, has come to salvation. I don't, I don't believe that's the case here. So what I believe is happening with Nebuchadnezzar, because we have more about his life, and we're going to speak about him more next week, is that he has not come to faith because repentance does not consist of saying a few words. Repentance has to do with persevering godliness. And so there are many people that are mistaken as to the nature of their soul because they said a few words sometime a long time ago, but it didn't affect their heart at all. And as we're going to see, Nebuchadnezzar's heart is not affected by these things. He has no consistent, lasting change that would lead us to believe that he has been born again or given true spiritual life. Nebuchadnezzar at this point is, if we look at the parable of the soils with Jesus, it's very helpful. If you remember the parable of the soils, the, the seed of the gospel or the word of God is tossed out on these grounds, these various dirts. One is a path, it's hard as a rock, and it says that person is like a person that doesn't understand what's being said to them. And the devil just snatches away these words. The second is like rocky soil, where the, the word of God falls on this rocky ground, but that as it, as it grows or it, it begins to take root in their heart, they receive it initially with joy, but there is no root, and because of difficulty or love of the world, they fall away immediately from these things. And this is what we see with Nebuchadnezzar. He's amazed by what he's seen, and he rejoices in it and says some good stuff, and like, let's make a new law, and then he's right back to the evil, conniving tyrant that he was before, and the whole next chapter is going to be about God bringing discipline and judgment into his life for that. And so there's no real change as to what has happened in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. And so I want you to see that when a person is changed from a sinner to a saint or a godly person, the Bible uses the word saint for all those who are in Christ Jesus, that there is a wholesale change. The whole person is made new. There is a change of the affections, there is a change of the will, there is a change towards a love of God. A person that did not love God before now loves the Lord. They love the things that God loves. They desire to do the will of God. They want to obey God. And there's not a slight uh, change, it's not something that is... Uh, brought about that's a, a, a little bit of a change, but it is a wholesale change, not a slight modification. There will be fruit 
Also, there will be noticeable fruit of a remarkable change. If we look at someone's life and we say, they look just like the world, but I know they said something a long time ago that, that makes me think they're a Christian. Well, if there's not a wholesale change and you see no fruit in a person's life, we have reason to believe that they are not truly changed. And so perhaps you are like Nebuchadnezzar. Sometimes you say good things about God, and sometimes you remark and say good things about Christian people and the way that they live their lives, but there's nothing different about you because when you say these things and you have a little bit of interest, a few days or a few weeks later, you go right back to wanting and loving and following after the things of this world. And you go right back to what you were before. And so this morning, I want you to not be fooled that you have not been born again. To be born again is to have a wholesale change in your life. And if you look at your life and you say, man, I've been saying certain words my whole life, but I know if I'm honest with myself that I still love this world. I still love the things of this world. I still seek the things of this world with all my heart. And if I compare myself to ungodly people, I'm basically just like they are. And the Bible often points us towards introspection, that we should take stock of our heart and look at where we are. And we should be able to gladly rejoice knowing that there has, in fact, been a change in our lives. If you do not have this transformation, if you do not have this salvation, Jesus says you will not enter the kingdom of God. For unless a person is born again, they will not enter the kingdom of God. And so it's a radically important question for you to look at yourself this morning and say, do I know Christ Jesus? Do I believe in him? Have I been changed by these things? And so, let us look in the comparison of Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We have a, a stark difference between those that walk by faith, live by faith, follow after the Lord God unto the most extreme end, and then the rash unbeliever that goes back and forth and all over the place. There's much to learn here in our soul. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this, this story. Thank you for the record of these things. Thank you for these friends. Thank you for your faithfulness because this story revolves all around the ability of Almighty God to deliver from death. That we put our faith in you, Lord. We trust in you. We believe in you. We walk by this faith and we know that you will stand with us and that you are able to deliver from anything that may come upon us. And I pray, God, that by reading and hearing this story, that our faith would be strengthened today. I pray that you would give us hope, Lord, that we might trust you for the unseen things in our lives. And I pray for the affections of our hearts, that they would truly, truly be turned towards you. I pray for those this morning that have heard these things about Nebuchadnezzar, and it makes them think of their own lives and question do I really love the Lord? Have I just been saying words, or do I really believe? And Father, I pray this morning that if there are any here that have not been born again, that they would trust you this morning with their life, that they would come to salvation. Today would be a new day, a day that is truly different. It's not just words said, but a change in the heart through a surrendering of our affections to the Lord Jesus. Be at work in our midst, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.